trust to the Cornwall Conservation Trust to Farm Cornwall Making a Living. I'm Bart Jones, I'm president of the Cornwall Conservation Trust. I have three short announcements and then three reasons why we did this. First, the announcements. Uh, at four o'clock this afternoon, we will have our annual meeting. Uh, it will be here, not the Olds Barn, because the Olds Barn is heated and it's a little cold out there. Uh, the second thing is uh, Chris Hopkins is having uh, essentially an open house tomorrow at noon at Stonewall Farm to thank everyone for all the support over the years for him and his farm. And third, tomorrow at 2 o'clock here. Oh, we can't hear you back here. I don't think it's on. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear that? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, the third thing is that tomorrow, uh, Richard Schlesinger and the Historical Society will be having a program on the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. That's at 2 o'clock here. So those are the three brief announcements. Uh, we missed two of them. <laughs> Only heard two? All right. Only heard three. Start over. The first one is at 4 o'clock, still the homegrown band is going to be entertaining you at our annual meeting here. The second one is open house at Stonewall Farm. The third one is the Historical Society is having a great event about World War I, the end of 100th anniversary, here at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, so why are we here? There are three reasons. First of all, Cornwall Conservation Trust owns over 300 acres of farmland and we need our farmers and we are also concerned that our farmers, some of whom are very young but others are not so young, that we want to keep that farming pipeline going. So that's uh, one reason. The second reason uh, is really that we want to recruit young farmers to Cornwall because we need jobs in Cornwall and one of the jobs that we can promote is farming. That will help keep the character of Cornwall at the same time boost the economy and we're hoping for lots of young babies so that our school population <laughs> will expand. And the last reason we're here is really what I think of as thinking globally and acting locally. Uh, Wendell Berry has written a lot about industrial agriculture and its effect on the environment. Uh, one of our colleagues, Shelley Harms, is from Iowa, and she talks about going home to Iowa now, and there are less birds, less insects. Industrial farming is an issue. We need to figure out how we can feed ourselves without killing the environment, and Cornwall did have an agricultural school at one time, and I'm thinking Cornwall could be a demonstration group of how you can feed people and not destroy the environment. So those are the, the three reasons why we're here. The way this is going to work, uh, we have a panel of farmers first for an hour talking about the challenges and rewards of farming. We're going to take a break about 10, 10, 15, and then we'll have a second panel talking about the resources of, for farming in Cornwall and in the area. And so I'm going to turn this over to uh, my neighbor on Popple Swamp Road and the chair of the Cornwall Agricultural Commission to run this particular panel of farmers. Bill Denee, over to you. Farm. Hopefully everything will go well and their closing date is the 14th of this month. Deborah Tyler from Local Farm and 
Rachel? Roxanne. Roxanne, I'm sorry. <laughs> Roxanne goes to RD Farms. RD Farms in Cornwall Bridge. So, um, what we'd like to do is start basically. So we like. Okay. So what we'd like to do basically is we're going to start and ask each panel member to talk briefly about how and why they got into farming. Two or three are their biggest challenges, and two or three of their most satisfying rewards. So, who would like to start? <laughs> Here, Richie. Richie, go on. Thank you, Billy. Um, everyone, thank you all for being here. My name is Richie Dolan, Maple Hill Farm. Um, my how I got into agriculture, I guess the best way to describe my great grandparents moved here uh, right around the year 1900. They bought a house and 100 acres for ten thousand dollars. If you can believe that, and. Uh, from there, my, the Great Depression hit him pretty hard, so uh, my grandfather, who was a World War I veteran actually, uh, got back from the war, went to Yukon, majored in agriculture, and immediately began dairy farming. That transferred to my mother and my father, who she met in high school, and uh, then the dairy herd was sold, and then the farm, like all lot of farms, have to transfer into uh, hay dealing and swine pigs. Um, and uh, we've been doing that ever since. And uh, I guess to start off with the three challenges of agriculture from my point of view, <clears throat> like an experienced farmer said to my father and I years back when we were having a bad day because of uh, losing pigs, for example, if you've got livestock, you've got dead stock. That's one of the <laughs> biggest challenges I think that we face, um, especially in the pig industry. You can do everything right, take every precaution, have the most up-to-date, modern, clean facilities, and no matter what, you have piglets that get stepped on by their mother, piglets that get laid on by their mother, piglets that simply get sick, okay, right in front of you. You can put you know, all the drugs you want into them to keep them healthy as can be, even painkillers to ease their pain, and you will still lose them. That's just part of agriculture. Uh, anybody that, with any kind of livestock knows that. Um, second challenge that we find in not so much with the pigs, but with the hay business, and everyone is seeing this, even if you're not a farmer, is the weather. Um, you can complain all you want, and that's what farmers actually do during bad weather. They meet up on the road with their tractors, their trucks, and they sit and have a little seance and they complain about how bad the weather is and how back in the days of their grandparents, the summers were long and dry and sunny and it hardly ever rained and you know, blah, blah, blah. In the winters, you were ice skating by Thanksgiving every time and there wasn't all this mud to deal with. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's a, she knows it too, it's the truth. Um, there's, Nothing more frustrating, and we saw it this year, for example, the hay season started off almost too good to be true, and it was. We, uh, second week in June, by Father's Day, there was dust on the ground, it, the fields were dry, people were making hay left and right, and just like clockwork, um, the third week in July, the jet stream took this odd twist, and we started getting all the air, I would say the jet stream, pumped out of the tropics, and I don't think since then we've gone much more than about 36 or 48 hours without some kind of rainfall happening. Um, you've got farmers burying equipment worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in their fields trying to chop their corn. Um, the second cutting market was almost non-existent this year because you simply couldn't get it to dry. And then comes winter. You've got sub-zero temperatures where you've got equipment that won't start because the fuel is gelled up. Hydraulic lines that won't work. You've got animals that cannot adjust to a temperature change when you've got 52 and foggy, and then 24 hours later it's 10 below with a wind chill. Um, and those are just, that's one of them. And the last challenge I'd say um, that is very grim for a lot of farmers that see this firsthand is the economic trouble hitting agriculture nowadays. Um, you have farms going bankrupt. 
Um, if anybody knows any dairy farmers, for example, whether they milk three dozen head or a couple thousand like jack ears do, it's just awful right now. Um, they, one farm out in Western New York, I was talking to a guy about, for example, I think they milk anywhere between six and 7,000 head of cow, and the farmer figures he has about $700 of debt for every cow he owns. And that's, it's unbelievable to think about. Um, and another thing that's a challenge is the lack, and this is, goes back to what Barb said, the lack of interest in the youth, okay? Um, I believe the average age of a farmer in America right now is 67 years old. It's, that's, by nowadays standards, that's not that old, I don't believe. Um, like it was considered 150 years ago. But to picture a 67 year old guy in the hot summer sun or the sub zero temperatures in the winter doing physical labor, you know, for 14 hours a day is pretty terrible. Um, and there's a severe lack of interest in the youth as far as physical labor, as too many of us know. Um, as we know, walking to school, a lot of people say they went uphill both ways, and that was after they did the milking for the day and the chores and everything. Um, nowadays, kids just get on the school bus with their smartphone, and uh, they, you know, that's about it. That's their only responsibility, and that translates to kids that simply don't want to get involved in agriculture, and they don't want to do any physical labor. Um, so enough of the depressing stuff. Um, <laughs> as far as the rewards, and there are plenty of them, um, even though I've always said for years with agriculture, the animals and the weather determine your schedule. A lot of that is true. But at the same time, um, you can work around your schedule too and make it work. Uh, for example, I had the privilege of helping coach my son's little league team and coaching a soccer team this year. If I worked 50 or 60 hours a week for a construction company and I had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning and couldn't leave till 5 because, you know, didn't want to get fired, I couldn't do any of that stuff. Um, that's a huge reward right there. Um, number two, the lessons that are taught on a farm when you're born on it or come on to it as a child, whatever, are absolutely second to none. Um, hard work, dedication, the patience and compassion you learn for animals. Um, even though, depending if you're in a business like a lot of us are, that yes, the animals eventually do end up sometimes in slaughter, um, you can still treat them in a humane way until they get to that point. Um, and you have to learn patience with them because you can't always communicate with them and you have to let them sometimes decide and work with them. And you know, they're stubborn. Uh, and the abilities and skills you learn you know, on a farm, you really can't learn anywhere else, I believe. Um, you learn to do things on a farm, like driving a tractor or a truck up and down the road when you're still in grammar school that a lot of people sometimes struggle with in their teens and 20s and can't even do. Um, and last but not least, for the rewards, I'd say, you know, doing something that's actually making a difference. Um, if I was stuck in a cubicle, all week, I, I don't know what I'd do. I, mean, I would truly lose my mind. Aside from being cooped up in an office all day um, in a cubicle, you're just another number on the you know, pay scale, and that's it, and you know, that's it. I'd much rather be spending roughly 70 hours a week doing, I don't know, physical labor on a farm than anything else. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. says and going working hard and being with the animals and giving them the best life we can um, you know our animals get the best view of the town of Cornwall because <laughs> we spent so much time clearing land they're like living up there where I have to say Mick Mansion could be looking down here at Cornwall but our cows and our sheep are up there and I feel every day that they're smiling <laughs> and, and what a wonderful life we live <laughs> The challenge, you know, the, the challenges of it was it's the weather. It's not fun some days, like Richie says, but you just got to get out there and do it. Um, that's 
And how I got into farming is I hooked up with very wonderful people and they gave me an opportunity that I could never have. So that's um, until I met them. So that's why we do it and we keep trying to go forward every day and trying to keep farming happening in the town of Cornwall and give the best product we can. Don't know how much more I can say about it. Love it and enjoy it. That's what we do. And hopefully everybody loves and enjoys what we do, what we give to the community. So I thank you and I guess I'm, that's it. <laughs> Generations. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in Cornwall Hollow. Um, and when I got in my 20s, I transitioned into cutting timber. I love cutting timber, but then as I got older, it was extremely difficult. You know, it's, it's, that's hard work. Uh, farming's hard work, so I sort of bought some beef cows, started raising beef cows, um, selling beef. Um, uh, the, the rewards are, they're, every day there's rewards. I mean, I, the fact that in Cornwall Hollow, where I, I have my main farm. Um, I try to keep it nice. Uh, I've a lot of people that stop and say how great it looks. A uh, prominent businessman in town asked if he could put a park bench up on Lake Road so people would stop and enjoy um, what I have. Um, um, I have moved some animals up to Cream Hill Farm, which I would love to be able to make um, into um, a great farm. Uh, I mean, it was at one time a dairy farm, but in the dairy business, there's surplus of milk, so making dairy cows up there, it's not going to work. But a beef farm, I think, would be um, great. I just need to try to keep on moving forward. Um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, Richie did a really good job <laughs> writing in. Um, maybe after we get done here, if there's any questions, we can certainly try to answer them. Thank you. We got involved in farming about 10 years ago, and we met in um, Manhattan on a job. We were artists, that's our background. <laughs> and um, what, what sort of started the process of getting us into farming was going to the farmer's markets in Brooklyn. They were really beautiful, and, and the products were just very appealing, and Jeff fell in love. He, he decided he wanted to be on the other side of the table, and so we did our first um, internship that uh, the, the fall of 2008, I think, and so um, that became, became our journey, and, and we fell in love, and uh, you know that's it's kind of just been our lives now. Um, so, uh, sort of going into the challenges for us. I think our biggest challenge is that we're not born and raised farmers, so it's been a journey for us to learn farming and to gain the knowledge to kind of progress and get to a place where we could have our own operation. And um, we, we didn't get started that young either. I was like 28 when we started, um, so it, it was, you know, an uphill battle for us, and, and Jeff always kind of regretted the fact that he didn't get started when he was in his early 20s, and we just had a lot of time on our hands. So, um, you know, that, that has also involved us moving a lot. Like, we've typically moved every year in kind of the pursuit of gaining knowledge, um, you know, through, it began as vegetable operations, and we were interns, and then we were farm workers, and then gradually we kind of earned the way to becoming managers, and, and now, we've gotten to the point where, where we can actually buy a farm and run it ourselves, which is exciting and, and terrifying and has its own challenges as well. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of the other important challenges. Financials are definitely a big one too. We don't have a lot of capital, you know, we're young, we come from the suburbs. And um, so we, we have struggled, you know, throughout this process of trying to find that right farm and trying to find a situation where, you know, we could actually make it. Um, so this has been an incredible opportunity for us that, um, you know, this company Dirt Capital has in, made it possible to finance this, this purchase to put us onto Stonewall Dairy. Um, so 
that's been nice. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, the other farmers have covered the, the other typical challenges of weather and, you know, just having things that you can't control. Um, so the, the, the biggest rewards, though, are also the, the lifestyle. You know, we get to eat so well and we get to live so well and we spend our time, you know, on the best days outside and we live with animals and, you know, and have this incredible bond with, it, with them. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, try and derailing a little bit. Um, so it's the healthiest we've ever been to, you know, when, when we were, before we were farming, we were just, you know, you know, in offices and doing things like that. And, and so, I mean, it's made us strong and it's, it's, it's given us incredible resolve and um, it's just, it's, it is a very rewarding lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of <laughs> it for me. I'm Deborah Tyler, and I run a local farm. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, right in the heart of Dairyland, but I didn't grow up on a farm. My father sold advertising space for the Dairyman's Bible, Hort's Dairyman. So I had no practical experience with cows, but I went to camp with drink more milk stickers on my suitcase. My towel said, everybody needs milk. I could, my family would not go into a restaurant without perusing the menu and making sure that milk was offered. And if not, my father would make a ruckus. So I had like, I had some good background, <laughs> mentally anyway. And then when I graduated from high school, I came east and spent a few months with my aunt and uncle, who had run a dairy farm in Canterbury, Connecticut. And my cousin, who's about 15 years older than I am, was my mentor. I did whatever he said. And it's all his fault. <laughs> he just had a real knack of making me feel like I was an important part of that farm. He would come running to find me. He'd say, Debbie, everybody called me Debbie then. Debbie, Debbie, number 316 is having her packed and she needs you. You've got to pull that calf out. <laughs> she would have calved fine. But the feet were out and I got to pull on that calf and feel like I was a hero. And so after those few months, I was really hooked. I, I just, I loved those cows. I loved being with them. Uh, I took a couple semesters at UConn in uh, dairy, dairy science, farm management. And uh, it was like, I knew even then that the scale and the model that they were promoting in school was not what I wanted to do. And so it took me 15 years, 15 years of wandering and trying all kinds of things and milking my neighbor's cows and volunteering on dairy farms. Uh, and then I was in Cornwall here and milking Dodie Clark's cow and we, we started brainstorming, and out of, that, out of that brainstorm came the idea of bottling and selling raw milk. And so, here I am, here's Little Farm. I bottled and sold raw milk for 20 years. Um, I was the first livestock farm in Connecticut to become certified organic. And because of, of uh, findings that maybe cows on grass only would produce better, more healthful milk for humans, I experimented with that, and now I feed no grain to my cows. 
So I had this little niche. And then, uh, and then my goal was to provide the very best milk possible for my community. And so all of those things, in my mind, was leading to that. But there's one step closer to the best milk possible. And that is if you milk it from your own cow. So I started offering workshops in keeping a family cow, and I started breeding smaller cows that make good backyard cows. <laughs> when Chris Hopkins was well established at Stonewall, I said, there's, there's a good source of raw milk for the people who need it and can't have their own cows, and so I stopped selling milk. And now my focus is mostly on workshops and helping people connect to the land. Challenges. As a raw milk producer, I think the biggest challenge was the hostility from the dairy industry. The very first winter I was in business, um, Marcus Dairy was doing home deliveries with milk in glass bottles. And somebody put one of my milk bottles in the return slot. And so the delivery person who was delivering Marcus Dairy came to me and said, may I deliver your product? And we worked, we worked with each other for a while. And it didn't seem like his company would allow him to do that. Well, maybe a few weeks after we decided that we couldn't do that, Someone showed up in a very big car, a very big man, a very bearded, dark, big man. He was wearing a very fancy fur coat. He had a gold chain around his neck. He had a big gold ring that was bigger than my thumb. He said, Marcus would like to buy you out. And I said, I'm not interested. He said, this is a really hard business. And he left. But I really felt threatened. And that's not the only big man that came to visit me. I had been in business maybe a year when the Milk Marketing and Research Board caught wind that I was selling milk. And they sent out a representative from Boston in a very big car and a very big man, but he had a crew cut. <laughs> and he was wearing a suit and tie. And I came home after doing my chores, and he was waiting in my driveway. What's this big man doing in my driveway? And he gets out, and he holds up his wallet, like in the movies, and says, I'm from the Milk Marketing and Research Board, and you owe us money. I'm not sure how much money I owe them. It's something like 15 cents for every 100 pounds of milk I sell. Maybe less. But I, have to fill, I had to fill out every month a form and then send in my 23 cents to Boston. <laughs> I had to do it, or maybe some days it would be 46 cents. It was not a lot of money. And the stamps cost more. And filling out that paperwork took a ton of time. I would call them and I would say, may I just send you $10 and then leave me alone for the year? <laughs> oh no, it's a federal offense if you don't do this every month. Well, I'm not very good at desk work and I'd forget and then I'd get these threatening letters, imprisonment, fines, for not doing this. 
I, I get caught up. And I got pretty normal and regular about it. But then the same big man would get a little bored, I think, I don't know. And he would say, I want to go see that nice little dairy farmer in Cornwall, Connecticut. <laughs> so he'd get in his big car and he'd drive all the way from Boston. And finally, he never called ahead. He would drive around until he could find me. Find me at my home, find me at the farm. Just hang out and wait for me. I don't know. And he'd say, we don't have record of your April payment. <laughs> and I would go in my file and I'd pull out my box and pull out the green piece of my green copy and I would say, here, here's the paper, I sent it in, you want me to find my check for you? And he would, he would be satisfied and he'd go away. That's our tax dollars at work. <laughs> or the milk marketing research boards money at work. I feel like that was hassle. Um, and then our state dairy department periodically tries to outlaw raw milk. And um, that has quieted down recently. But when I first started, every couple years, I would be testifying about the benefits of raw milk and the safety of raw milk. And the latest comes from organic cow. Organic cow feels like small raw milk producers are a threat. And so they've gone to the insurance companies and convinced the insurance companies that raw milk is too much of a risk. And so most insurance companies will not, um, will not cover raw milk dealers. And the few that do, it's exorbitant. So that's all coming from the dairy industry. It's not coming from dairy farmers. I would say the dairy farmers in this area have been my biggest support. I just want to make that clear. But the industry, the industry has been, I think, the greatest challenge to maintaining a raw milk dairy. Um, another challenge is defining and maintaining boundaries. Keeping my cows in is a challenge. And uh, I don't want to say I want to keep people out, but there's an attitude that a farm is like a playground and you can bring your kids there and let them run. And you can even do that when there's nobody there. And you can even do that, I mean, there, there are people who send their kids over, you know, we, we've got a friend visiting from New York, you know, go on over and see the bunnies at local farm. And I'm not there. I've had a rabbit skunk in my barn bite my cows. What if that skunk was there when the kids were there? I've had people there when I'm there and had them have things fall on their heads. What if that happened when the kid was there? I, I don't know why that attitude is so prevalent. And like I said, I don't want to discourage visitors, but there's got to be a little more respect for people's property and the fact that it's a place of work. It's not a playground. And then time and balancing time and shoulds. I would love to spend all day there, all the time. But I should take care of my taxes. I should take care of all my paperwork. I should spend more time with my family. I should spend more time in my community. <coughs> but I love being on the farm. And so, of course, that's the reward. Being outside, being a part of life. Um, I buy my hay so I don't have to struggle like these guys. Um, so I love all the weather. And what I love the most is when I have a cow that's about to calve 
and I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm worried. <laughs> and if it's cold and windy and sleeting, that's the best. I go out in the dark and stumble around with a flashlight until I find that cow. And there's nothing that makes you feel so alive as looking for life in the dark, in the wind, in the rain. Can't be beat. Um, another reward is feeling that the work I do is contributing to the beauty of the place I live and that and the earth because the soil where local farm is is steadily improving. The cows when we first got there, um, a neighbor had said there's not enough food on these 14 acres to pasture one cow and one calf. But with careful management, that soil now holds a dozen cattle and, uh, and it just keeps getting better, better and better. Feels good to be improving the soil making a contrib contribution to the Earth's health. And then that's my own reward, personal reward, is my own health. Um, when I was teaching school, I had to go see the chiropractor, I had to go see the therapist. Um, I spent a lot of time in the doctor's office. And since being on the farm, I have constant exercise, I'm way stronger than most of my peers. I have to be very careful um, when men my age come and want to help me because if I let them pick up what I'm carrying, they're going to hurt themselves. <laughs> Not this crew. <laughs> but, and then and I just take that for granted. Um, and my health, and my food, you know, I'm, I'm producing milk and making cheese and butter and eggs and garden vegetables and they're all fresh and all organic and just, just the best. So I'm eating well, I'm exercising, I'm getting lots of fresh air, getting lots of sunshine, that vitamin D, and I have peace of mind because I believe in what I'm doing. And the final uh, reward <laughs> are the numbers of people who come to me and thank me. People who thank me just for having a beautiful thing to drive by. People who thank me because, um, because they bring their children to me to visit the cows that fed them when they were pregnant. People who have their own cows now and have changed their lives. People who used to buy my milk and, uh, you know, it, they would buy their milk on a Monday, they would skim the cream off on Tuesday, they would make butter and uh, use the skim milk in making bread. It changed their lives and brought them more home centered. These are the things that. Uh, our great reward. Thank you. Hi, my name is Roxanne Roche. Um, I am a part of RD Farm, along with Daniel Coleman over there, um, and uh, the rest of his family. Um, I don't know if anybody of you know uh, Denny Frost. We uh, farm Daniel is, is Denny's grandson, and, and we uh, have continued farming that land. I um, can only speak for myself why I got into farming. Um, you know, I, I wasn't born on a farm. Uh, I was born in Alaska, and it, we lived a really self-sufficient lifestyle. Uh, we lived out in the sticks. Um, we 
shot, or you know, we, we hunted for most of our meat. Um, we were fortunate because my mother um, worked outside of the village, and so she would um, send produce and food back home. So we ate well, but um, I think, I really think farming is in my blood. Uh, I have always had a, a draw to it. Um, my great grandparents were ranchers in Wyoming. Um, they had a very large herd of, of beef cattle. Um, they raised turkeys. My great grandfather was the president of the Turkey Association, I think the National Turkey Association. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and it's always been a draw for me. I, I think I've had this dream, this disjointed dream of uh, having a farm, I mean, my whole life. And I didn't really realize it until, I, I think a few years ago, when I met Daniel and his family, and it just sort of started to evolve into reality. Uh, we <laughs> bought a discounted herd of cattle because they had horns, and the other person didn't want them. <laughs> Uh, so we had, you know, these 13 cows, and um, we figured, well, might as well just keep going. And we did. And then uh, I'd always had, I'd had chickens, and that grew. You know, I started realizing, well, there's an egg market, so people want eggs, so let's just have more chickens. So I got an incubator, and I, I mean, it just was an evolution of of it. I don't think we started out with a, a direct vision in mind, um, but we're sticking to it and it's been incredibly rewarding, incredibly frustrating, and I have, I have grown up a lot in the process. We're in the beginning stages. Uh, we're still growing a, a beef herd. Most of them um, are cows and and we have the yearlings, we have maybe eight yearlings now, um, and another batch of this year's calves. So we're, we're still building the herd. Uh, we have, we're doing pigs, we're doing pork, um, you know, but I mean, the, really the challenge is, is, is marketing uh, our product, um, finding people, and really the economic part of it you know, <laughs> the money that goes in and the effort that goes in, it's a little bit difficult to um, make it back out, you know, to make the money out of it. Uh, but, you know, the rewards are, are many. Um, the lifestyle is rewarding and, and beautiful and the connection to the animals and we just haven't figured out a way to make it pay so that we can quit our day jobs, I guess is really how it, uh, what it boils down to. But we're trying, you know, we really are. Um, so, I think the challenge is, uh, Richie touched on, live, if you have livestock, you have dead stock. And I have a, quite a connection with my animals, I love them dearly. Um, I probably shouldn't um, consider them like the family that I do, but it's just my personality. So that's been a difficult thing for me to, not growing up in a farming environment, that's been a difficult thing for me to come to terms with, is no matter what you do, you can do everything perfect, you can do everything right, you can keep a clean barn, you can care about them, you can check on them every second, and still, there's still gonna be accidents. Um, another challenge, I think, is the time management has been difficult for me, uh, for us. You know, we work, Daniel works full time, I work part time, it had to become less because I was picking up the details of all the stuff at home. Um, and so the time management thing and, and being able to get away from the farm just for a minute, just to feel like a real person again. You know, 
you're there and all these, I walk up to the barnyard and, and I got cows mooing at me and, and a herd of turkeys following me and all these pigs squealing and I'm like, just sometimes I don't want someone to depend on me, but in that situation, it's, it's not possible. You've got all these critters who depend on you for their sustenance and their life and to move them around on pastures and they do depend on, on us. So that's been a challenge. Um, and making it a sustainable and efficient, economically, um, has, has, is a challenge. It, it's just a challenge that I, not growing up in farming, have had to figure out along the way. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a challenge. So the rewards, I think, are money. Uh, I love animals. I, I really love animals. Sometimes I love animals more than people. Sorry. <laughs> they are... Um, I just love them. And, and uh, the observation of them and the care of them and... Really, I mean, observing a, a cow in her natural environment... Uh, I mean, I guess it's not natural. There have been, you know, humans... <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> to observe a cow herd and, and to see like the routine that they have and the incredible care for their, their young and you know the, the babysitter you know taking all the, the calves so that all the other moms can graze and you know it's just that in, it, in and of itself and, and the pigs, I mean the pigs they just they get out all the time, and they're so incredibly frustrating because you're chasing them down the road, <laughs> and you want them to go back in, but of course they're not going to do what you want. In fact, the more you try and chase them and whatever, the less they're going to do what you want. So, but in that, that sounds like a challenge, but in that, I, I get incredible joy. I do. And uh, it's actually one thing also. I used to write a lot. I used to, I used to enjoy writing, like writing stories. Um, and for a long time, I didn't write. Uh, I didn't create that. And I feel like this farming experience, this farming life, this um, this thing that I found myself in, has given me the the material to open that up again. And I feel like as a creative person, that's, that's important. It's important to find a muse in, in something. Um, it brings meaning to my life that I didn't have for a while, and I do now. So that reward is, is priceless. I mean, it's, it's, it'd be nice to make money, but that in itself would be the reward that, it needs, that, that is enough, really. Um, but I think I need one more reward. <laughs> so I really, another reason why we got into farming, another reason I got into farming, was because I love to cook, and I love really good food, and it was just like, I want to raise my own pig so I can have really amazing pork. And we did that, and I was like, wow, this is really amazing pork. Um, and other people were like, hey, can I have some of that really amazing pork? <laughs> and they just like, the food that we get out of, that in itself could be a reward enough. I mean, maybe we don't have to make money. We just make really good food. And I, I love to cook. It's my most favorite thing. So, you know, I have my own fresh eggs. We have really good beef. We got really good pork. And I can, you know, I have all this, these, you know, the ofo, like the guts and stuff that people don't want to buy. And I love that stuff and I can make amazing recipes and, I don't know. Farming has been a, it has made me an adult. I mean, really, I am an adult, I'm 33 years old, but I think that through the hard work of it, um, it has shown me the priorities in life. You know, the priorities in life, which are not, Money. They are, are not, I mean, it, that's important. You're supposed to be able to sustain yourself. But it is, the priorities to me have become 
keeping my animals safe, well-fed, healthy, happy. I mean, really happy. Because what's the point? Why have a small farm if your animals aren't happy? Like, there's plenty of factory farms out there where cows are grown in tents and, and they're just in their own excrement. And it's just, you know, there's plenty of that. If I'm going to be a small farmer, I'm going to concentrate on making my animals happy. And that's really kind of why I do what I do. I, I, if I'm going to eat meat, I made a decision that I needed to know where it came from. And that was just a, growing it myself, growing it ourselves, was just sort of a logical part of that. And I uh, don't know, I think I, that's it. I <laughs> think. I'd like to thank all of the folks here at the table. I think they have expressed about everything that farming has, has its ups and it has its downs. And I think these folks need a big round of applause. <laughs> Got a few minutes left. And uh, I'd like to field a few questions from the audience. If anybody has a question for anybody, or raise your hand. So um, I think everybody in this room wants to support local farms. And um, for example, when I go to a supermarket, I mean a small local supermarket like Le Bon's or Jim's, I would prefer to buy eggs, for example, from one of you guys. I don't see, sometimes I see something that says local farm, but it doesn't say, I don't have a sense that the local markets are, are giving you the presence that I would like to see. Do, so can you tell me what's going on and how we could help you more, how we could buy your products in, in a store? My experience on that, being a local farm, everybody being a local farm, we can't produce enough to mass produce to fill a store in my farm, being a grass-fed, grass-finished beef and lamb. We can't, everybody wants prime cuts, so the store wants the prime cuts, the restaurant wants the prime cuts to be, and to put it in the market, we're gonna, we're gonna run out at some point. So the farmer's market is the way we produce, where we sell our product. The Cornwall Country Market supports us by selling our product there. Uh, Berkshire Store, Ryan in North Fork sells our stuff. But it's hard to keep the stock going all the time because of processing once a year. The eggs, I don't, Rockland might be able to answer that question. But like the, at the farmer's market, that's one of the things that runs out the fastest is the eggs because you either have to be a huge farm, but, but if you're a little farm, you only produce so much. That's my. I'll add just a little bit. Um, usually the products that we sell are available like at the farm and so um, to work with grocery stores, I mean farmers are busy, like we're really busy, I know that shouldn't be an excuse to, you know, take the product to the grocery, you know, go collect the money, I mean it's just a very complex relationship with the grocery store. So, our products are usually available at the farm, and I know it's harder for people to go to the farm and, and say, like, not get the one-stop shop, but um, it actually is more fulfilling, I, I think, to go get your eggs from so-and-so, go to, you know, somebody's freezer who sells beef, and, and to, like, gather all your stuff for one meal. That's just one thing that I thought I could add. And also, like, we can't produce enough to Keep it in the um, with me, I think the biggest thing is with beef, it's hard to, I think it would be hard for a local store like Jam to take a half of an animal, a fresh piece of side piece of animal, and be able to utilize it before, you know, it's not, you know, before it, it's not, uh, what should I say, before expiration date. <laughs> you know, I, all my product is all frozen, which is fine. Some people do love to have fresh, produce, 
And so for them to take, you know, a half a steer, I, I really have, I've tried, I did go over to jam and talk a little bit, but I haven't really followed through with it. You know, even if they wanted primal cups, um, I would love to be able to do, you know, one-stop shopping for me. It's easier for me, it's less time consuming, and I think I could do it. I mean, I do have the potential, certainly with having up the cream hill to have all that land up there for, for feed and cows and stuff, but I just haven't been able to connect you. I, and marketing is, is, is huge. Like Roxanne said, if I could, if there was people that could market for us, I can't do it all. I'm much more better standing out in my field, <clears throat> you know, doing what I do there. If, if there was marketing, that's the key, you know, is finding markets for our produce. I mean, we do have, there's a lot out there that could be done, but it's, it's the marketing that, that, that I find very difficult to do. I, I know they've covered a lot of the bases, but definitely I think for a lot of small farms, the, the farm stand is the best way for us to be able to sell our products to the customers. I know Stonewall has a lot of relationships with like Le Bon Market and other places, um, and Chris so far has provided milk and eggs, but I know there's limitations, especially on eggs. That's one of the, the most challenging things to provide. Um, we are hoping to grow our, our our, our chicken flock so that we can provide more eggs to the public because they disappear so quickly. So that's definitely one of our goals. Anyone else? Mark? Uh, I wanted to thank the Ag Commission and uh, Bart of Cornwall Land Trust for doing this. This is, this is really great. Um, when Bart came to me, I'm Mark Burry from uh, Boost Tonics School at the Ag School there. When he came to me and said you were going to do this, my head exploded when he said making a living um, because that's how you're going to attract young people to this business. And Roxanne's referring to exactly what I'm thinking about too. And Bill, you know, from the marketing standpoint, or the marketing end of this, and the business plan is, is what kids need to see to address what Richie said, getting them interested. The, the kids are out there that want to work even in the city, um, but they're not seeing the, the economics of it. But anyway, the, the, I thought Bill might mention, I don't know, and I don't, I'm not the beef uh, right in it, but processing your beef, um, is, is that easy to do, or is that something that's needed? It's yeah. easy now. There's a great place yeah, called in Plymouth where they both have a kill station and a processing place in it. it it's so that's really, a, it, that's for the longest time, we were taking animals to Bristol to get to, to get slaughtered and then they had to get brought back to Lidsfield Locker. But now there's a place right there. Yeah. But that's also a hard thing to do. I'm lucky enough that I do move enough animals through that I'm able to call, you know, I, I'm, I might be a week or two weeks before I can get an animal in, but I know there's the people processing plants that are around New York State and stuff. Uh, it takes months because there's not enough processing to produce local uh, product. So that's a need. So uh, we'll end it at that. I'm sure there are more questions. There's another panel <clears throat> coming in about 15 minutes. I just, uh, Gordon Ridgway couldn't be here today, and I wanted to read uh, remarks of his that would, I think, be a pretty good summary of what the farmers have said. Uh, dear Bart, our family continues to operate a mixed farm on approximately 100 acres on Town Street. We use another 20 acres around town, including some CCT land at Rattlesnake Road, for which we're grateful. We raise vegetables, animals, maple syrup. We sell our products from Woodbury, Connecticut to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Most of our crops are sold locally at two farm markets and our vegetable stand but our maple syrup makes it around the world. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Some challenges to farming here are common to other areas. Long hours, low wages, and increasingly volatile climate this year, wet pests and accidents, among other challenges. Some things are Cornwall area specific, including rocky soils. An increasingly elderly population eats less than young families. <laughs> Come on, let's poke up. <laughs> also, fewer young people can make for a labor shortage, especially when one can get paid $20 an hour for cutting grass in the summer instead of $12 an hour for farm work. Mm -hmm. 
On the other hand, we found farming here to have rewards. The community has constantly supported us in our efforts to keep the corn in Cornwall by stopping by at our farm stand and our farm market. Over 35 years, we've been blessed to have neighbors who have helped us through emergencies large and small. We have been able to always assemble a talented team to get through the growing season, having some fun and developing lifelong friendships. Feeding a lot of people, this year including four area food banks, creates a lot of goodwill. Probably the biggest reward for me is being part of a self-reliant family that over time has acquired the necessary skills needed to overcome the constant challenges of living on a commercial farm in Cornwall in 2018. So, thanks again to our farm panel. The next panel will start in about 15 minutes and it will be resources for farming. Thank you.